The VO Meter, measuring your voiceover progress. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 15 of the VO Meter, measuring your voiceover progress. So we are very excited because we have our audiobook roundtable coming up in a few minutes, but we have an interesting episode for you today because several of our uh, little mini shows, I guess, our questionable gear purchase, our current events, and our VO meter stick are all related. So uh, why don't you start this off, Paul? Questionable gear purchase. Okay, well, we always like to start with current events, and current events for me was attempting, and uh, poorly, to improve my recording space again. So I found this ridiculous price on a double-walled enhanced whisper room that happened to be located in Beaverton, Oregon. So obviously that's a little bit further, a little bit of a distance from Baltimore, Maryland, let's say, and I had to have it shipped out here. It was, a, it was a, a sale on eBay that I found, and because I'm me, I just went ahead and bought it and <laughs> paid the money and said, I'll figure out how to get it here. It's a great <laughs> price. Who cares? I'll figure out the shipping later. Then I started to do a little research on just how freaking heavy and big an enhanced whisper room is, and one found out that it weighs just about 1,200 pounds, and that's about double of what my current whisper room weighs. Makes sense because it's almost the same size. The one I was buying is a 3 by 5 by 5 and the one I'm in is a 4 by 4 This is feet. So because it's a double-walled booth, it makes sense it's about double the weight. But when I started to look at where I would put it in my house, I came across some structural engineering uh, issues. So Queries. <laughs> right. It's something I had in the back of my mind. I have a local uh, a friend who's a contractor that lives up the street, and we talked about this before, that you know, if I were to build something, I'd have to be careful with that because I keep my, my booth on the second floor of my house. Really no other option because the the floor, the floor ceilings in my basement are pretty low. And plus, because of impact vibrations where people are walking on the floors, it never would work in my basement with my three kids trampling around all the time upstairs. So I want to back up a little bit, though, Paul, because I remember when you first told me that you got this, my first question was why? <laughs> I mean, you already have a booth, like, and most most of our listeners probably are assuming like that's the end game, right? Like, you've got a booth, you're in. That's just one, like that area of your studio upgrade should be done. Is that like how is that not the case for you? Well, I've talked ad nauseum about the giant highway in my backyard and the vibrations from that that in, that creep into my recordings, and they still do. I use an expander on my Apollo Twin interface to keep it somewhat at bay, but I've been doing an, I've been engineering a book for another author, I think I mentioned, and in listening to those files back, when it's not my own voice especially, I can hear that vibration creeping in through the expander during the dead spaces, and it's just annoying. I'd, it, I'd like to be able to somehow end it once and for all. So that was my mm-hmm. thinking anyway. So that's why I thought double-walled booth, and also I should mention in doing some consulting with our friend George Whittem, he had told me at one point that he thinks a double-walled whisper room would be enough to block all of that external highway noise based on what he's heard in my files. So that was my that was my motivation. So And so people who might not, like, as you can guess, not all ISO booths or even whisper rooms, which is a brand of vocal isolation booths, are created equal. Like, I mean, of course, you've got different um, height and length and size dimensions and weight as you can tell like there's almost a 600 pound difference between the single wall that paul currently has and the double wall that he was looking into but what that extra mass does is it like it increases the amount of acoustic dampening that you have of sound isolation and so as he was pointing out it would actually hopefully get rid of those vibration problems that he's been fighting for almost two years now yeah to eliminate sound waves from, from penetrating your space, you need mass, whether it be concrete, wood, uh, lead would be the best, but I'm not lining my house with lead. <laughs> and it would save you from Superman. So the denser the material, yeah, exactly. The denser the material, the better it is at blocking sound. So back to the, the structural design. In, in looking at the, the code for most U.S. states, every state is different. Sometimes even counties have different building codes. The the amount of weight you're supposed to have on a residential floor, second floor, is about 30 pounds 
per square foot or 40 pounds per square foot uh, if you're a little bit more conservative. So, or sorry, the other way around, 30, 30 pounds if you're conservative, 40 pounds if you really want to push it. And doing my math, my, my calculations, it seems that it would be more like 50 pounds per square foot for this 1,200-pound booth on my floor. And uh, those weights that are based on the building code are, are usually based on moving weight, not dead weight. So a booth is, in my in my opinion, is, is an issue because it's dead weight. It's going to sit in one spot forever or until I no longer do this job, which hopefully is not sooner rather than later. <laughs> yeah. But that's just dead weight. It's going to sit there forever. So, you know, people will, will argue, well, you don't panic when you have 30 people in your house for a cocktail party. True, but they're moving around and, and they're getting drinks and they're, they're getting food. They're going outside. They're not standing in one spot 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So ultimately, I, had, I decided this was not going to work. And I called up my good friend, Sean, and said, hey, you're near Oregon, or at least closer than I am. Why don't you buy it? And at first, I will say I got very excited. I mean, this was an amazing price for, because like we were saying, a lot of people have gotten these single walled units from either Whisper Room or someone else, and they weren't satisfied because they didn't completely get rid of the, um, or the noise issues, which is why most people get an isolation booth in the first place. So, um, so it's very unfortunate when people have to make that additional upgrade or even um, sort of like add a room within a room to the existing space to get rid of that extra sound. But I mean, for me, I was so excited. I thought it was similar enough to the uh, the current setup I have that it wouldn't be too disruptive. So uh, I had the same concerns about weight. And, but after talking to a few uh, engineer friends who were kind of able to like to calm my fears, uh, my dad and I started measuring out um, the dimensions of the, the or the potential dimensions of the booth. And we just couldn't find anywhere in the house that would have been an ideal working space. I mean, if I wanted to be surrounded by like the furnace vents in the laundry room, then yeah, I could have gotten the booth and put it in the basement. But I'm like, the whole point of, of having that that office, that studio space is to sort of have like a very creative, conducive atmosphere, you know? Isn't that what we all want who are trying to pursue this full time? So, um, so unfortunately, after a lot of hemming and hawing, I realized that maybe now is not the best time to put a booth in here. And I mean, my house in rural Washington is pretty much quiet 90% of the time. So I don't have a lot of the noise issues that say someone in a larger city might or who's near a freeway might have. Right. So the the worst part about this whole thing was that I had already put my booth on uh, for sale on a couple of the <laughs> voiceover groups and on Craigslist. Some of you may have seen it. And, this is very uh, telling of your personality in general, Paul. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> or I, both of our personalities how we handled this. I got some people's hopes up, including our, our friend of the program, um, Bob Johnson, who is going to come on and talk to us in a few minutes about the experience as part of our BO meter shtick. <laughs> Hey, everybody. It's time for the VO meter shtick. What did he say? It's time for the VO meter... Oh, never mind. The VO meter shtick? Oh, got it. So we are here with Bob Johnson on the VO meter shtick, and I'm here to talk about, or talk more about, the ridiculous booth purchase that never was. Because Bob, as I think we talked about in the intro, was on the other end of the transaction, or at least supposed to be, where I had posted my booth for sale and was going to sell it to Bob, who lives not too far from me, looked like a match made in heaven, and then I done went and blew up the whole thing. So, Bob, I wanted to first apologize in front of the whole world, or at least our 3,000 listeners, and say I'm sorry for reneging on the deal, but as you've heard, it just couldn't be helped. You absolutely do not have to apologize, uh, but it is kind of Johnson luck. Uh, have the opportunity to uh, get a nice whisper room at a decent price, and then all of a sudden it devolves into a discussion on floor loads and, uh, and, <laughs> and things like that. So uh, uh, we learn a little bit more in the industry, and I am still looking for a whisper room, so to speak. But, but no, you absolutely do not have to apologize. Well, it's funny. It actually sort of um, became a value add for the entire industry. I'm not sure if you followed Sean's post in Facebook where he was asking people about structural load in his house and other people jumped in and said wow i never thought of that 
And that thread has now grown to like 100 responses with people <laughs> adding. I did see that. <laughs> and again, after talking to you about it and then seeing Sean uh, talking about it on Facebook, I'm thinking, wow, maybe this is something that uh, people do need to pay attention to. And again, I'm the same way. I didn't really think about floor load or things like that. Uh, I'm fortunate that I record in the basement. Uh, again, the only thing I was uh, worried about, of course, I wasn't worried about it. My wife was worried about the aesthetics of uh, our basement with a whisper room in it. So that devolved more into how can we spruce up the whisper room to make it look more amenable to, uh, to our downstairs area. Yeah, I think Sean admitted in the the intro that that was part of his decision too. That he's still he's living with his parents. Um, he's much younger than you and I, and he's he's back with his parents while he sorts out what he's doing long term. And they weren't too keen on having the big black monolith in their in their living room either. I did agree uh, that we could put a window box outside of uh, outside of the whisper room as well as a welcome mat, and I'll put a little some plastic trees around it. So at least it'll look like a little. Uh, as I call it, my retirement home. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I will certainly keep an eye out for other deals. Uh, as fans of the show know, I've actually done this before. Um, look, this time last year almost, Sean and I had almost an identical discussion where I had purchased a booth and was trying to unload it onto him um, as he was coming back from Japan. And it's because I was looking for one up in, uh, in the northern part of New York. And I actually put friend of the show, Patty Gibbons, onto it. And mm -hmm. she ended up buying it. So... That story worked out. Hopefully, there's still some way we can work things out for you. <laughs> no, I'm, see how I'm, it goes. I'm okay now. And again, I'm just looking for the whisper room specifically, uh, you know, just to improve the room tone a little bit, but also in my uh, quest to upgrade microphones as well. I tend to do this in a stair step method. I don't want to go high end microphone, but not have the uh, the proper uh, sound area for it. So, um, so I'm fine with where I am now, as as we said on the phone. You know, it's not a priority for me, but at the same time, I think many of us, uh, especially at my level, always looking for a little bit more to improve. Uh, and that's why I like listening to the, the VO meter. I'll give you guys all a, a shout out as well, uh, as well as uh, voiceover body shop as well. I mean, you learn so much from that. Some of it's really technical. Some of it's baseline. Uh, that it helps a little bit of all of us in the industry uh, learn and, 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 and continue to develop. Well, thanks for the kind words. And it sounds like you are, you have taken some of that stuff to heart, talking about not getting a good microphone until you have the space to record it. We've been preaching right. that, and George and Dan preach that as well. It just makes perfect sense. Yep. But tell us a little bit, Bob, about your, your uh, professional resume and the environment you do record it now. We'd be curious to hear. Actually, I've been in the, the voiceover business for about 10 years. I kind of started uh, differently from most people is that I was already in the federal government uh, in the Intel community and used to do a lot of their classified narrations, documentaries, e-learning. So kind of started from the inside. And then when I retired uh, three years ago, I decided to do I decided to do much more on the outside. Uh, which has proven a little bit more difficult than uh, than I thought, and <laughs> we've all the found same that out. <laughs> many people in uh, the voiceover world. For me, it was more the technical side, though, because I was uh, recorded more of uh, uh, of a classified nature. Everything I did was in a studio, so to actually step out from that world and have to create my own studio environment in terms of recording, editing, mastering, um, and, and all of that. That's proven to be much more difficult, but at the same time, uh, something that I've actually enjoyed learning how to do. So right now I am uh, surrounded by Aurelex panels in a five foot cove inside of our uh, uh, downstairs in our basement area, which actually is a great recording area because I have three solid walls. Uh, so really I only have to fill in one that I use with some Aurelex uh, paneling. I've two four-foot Oralex pa panelings that I use behind me. And the sound floor and the noise floor is usually pretty good. Uh, I do get a little bleed in from, you know, either whatever is happening outside, whether it's, you know, the pressure of the house or or the, uh, the temperature of the house. So in that way, with a, a whisper room, I, I want to be able to control that just a little bit more. Well, Bob, I like I said, I we will keep. A, I will still be on the lookout for you. See what we can do. <laughs> There's always deals popping up. Um, 
and hopefully we can work something out for you. But I do, no, I do I appreciate, appreciate you being on and sharing your story with us. No, and you don't have to apologize. And I, and again, I, I thank you and Sean for all that you do for the, uh, the voiceover world. And, uh, and I always look forward to tuning into you guys, you know, every other week, uh, and uh, voiceover body shop, as well as Julie Williams. I mean, I listen to her podcast. So, you know, there's a lot of people out here. We're not really that active on the Facebook posts, uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of people on the sidelines who learn quite a bit from you guys. Fantastic. Well, we'll try and uh, keep up the good work. All right. And I appreciate the, uh, the apology and I appreciate you uh, looking out for me. All right. We'll talk to you soon, Bob. Take care. All right. Thanks. Talk to you later. <laughs> So, Bob, once again, my apologies. I'm glad you're still a friend of the show and, and willing to talk about it and talk to me. But in the end, it all worked out because Bob is pretty happy with his recording space at the moment, and I was able to get my money back from the, the person I purchased it from on eBay, more importantly. And last I checked, it's gone off of eBay, so it looks like he must have sold it and probably for a better price than he gave me. So, <laughs> as they say, all's well that ends well in love and war. Well, we both had learned a lot from it, I think. I mean, like something I've learned from you, Paul, is to always have to be on the lookout for not just incredible deals on boosts, but on audio equipment in general. I know you've uh, frequent your local guitar center and have been able like uh, gotten some incredible deals on mics and interfaces that way. So it's good to have like your sort of finger on the pulse if you're looking to upgrade because you can usually save quite a bit of money if you're a little patient and perseverant. Yeah, indeed. So my plan now is to sort of retrofit the existing booth I have. Because the other thing I thought about is that one of the worst experiences of my life was lugging this whisper room into this second floor all by myself. <laughs> and I don't want to do that again. So at least I'll try and reinforce what I have in here, maybe either some extra MDF that I can buy myself or some plywood and see if I can at least mitigate the, the sound enough that I can uh, expand it out with the Apollo and hopefully we'll be done with it. Stay tuned. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I think, like, I've hired you out for narration projects and thought it sounds fine. So, like, so I think we both kind of realized that maybe we were trying to solve a problem we didn't necessarily have or just was trying to find the wrong solution for it. Yeah, it definitely could be the case. All right, so that pretty much covers everything for questionable gear perches and VO meter shtick, but we don't want to keep you guys away from all of the awesome information you're about to hear during our audiobook roundtable. Now, I have to give some credits to Paul. He did he really did his homework and gathered some people at the top of their game. We have some A-list narrators like Scott Brick, Sean Pratt, Andy Arndt, some audiobook producers like uh, Stephen J. Cohen and Deborah Dion, and we've just got a really nice, well-rounded panel who's just filled with so much experience and insight into the audiobook industry today. So without further ado, let's take you to the Zoom room. Welcome, everybody, to episode 15 of the VO Meter. And we are so excited because we have our audiobook roundtable. We scheduled this some time ago, and we are so excited to have a distinguished panel of audiobook narrators, producers, and even coaches. And we want to get right to it. So starting going clockwise, I guess, on my screen, why don't each of you tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and how you got started in the business. So Andy, would you please start? Well, my name is Andy Arndt, and I am a narrator and producer and coach. And I have a background in both public radio, and I say public radio because uh, it, public radio tends to value an authentic voice more than a morning zoo, boomy voice. Um, and I also have a background in theater. I taught acting and voice at James Madison University Theater and Dance Department for 12 years. So to me, theater plus radio is like the Reese's peanut butter cup that adds up to audiobooks. So that's how I got into it. I mean, that's not the actual first job I got, but that's the background that I have. So. Fantastic. And uh, Deborah, Deborah Dion. Oh, hey there. Um, yes, um, I am, am a producer in Los Angeles and um, been in the audiobook business since 1990. My husband, um, who's since passed away three years ago uh, from ALS, uh, Bob Dion and I got into the business together after we were uh, first married. Uh, he, had, he worked in, in radio and he uh, had an extremely long commute once he decided to marry me and, and move uh, to where I live. And so uh, in those days, um, you know, books on tape and recorded books were selling um, un uh, an abridged 
book, like uh, taking a, a, a book and bridging it down to uh, three hours and, and having uh, two cassettes in a package, 45 minutes on each side. And, and, uh, and they were also doing unabridged books, um, you know, on a rental basis. So uh, Bob wound up getting uh, a copy of uh, This Present Darkness, uh, uh, authored and read by uh, Frank Peretti. And he listened to it in the car and came home shaking the package and said, oh, my God, this is what we're going to do. And uh, so I sat and listened to it that night with him. And uh, he said, well, I, I uh, don't know how we're going to make this or how it's made, but um, let's figure it out and let's be part of this, this thing. It's going to be big. And uh, I said, okay. So we, we, we studied the package and it said that it had been produced at Mark Rao Studios in Burbank. And so we called, uh, Bob said, oh my God, I know that guy. I, I met him at a party, uh, you know, so he called him, um, you know, this was over the weekend. And, and so we called him on a Monday morning and Mark actually remembered who Bob was. And uh, he didn't think he was crazy for asking him how we were going to make this thing. So uh, Mark uh, taught him um, his craft for six months. And then uh, Bob went off on his own and, and uh, thanks to Jessica Kay, um, you know, who at the time owned the publishing mills, she helped us to um, buy our first equipment, and uh, we then built her, uh, you know, little by little for it, uh, or, or actually, you know, took it off her invoice. <coughs> over time. And, um, and the rest is history, you know, back in those days, it was reel to reel, uh, you know, machines and, and razor blades and blue tape, and, um, and then the digital age didn't come until much later. So, so yeah, it was a uh, it was a, a a lovely start, and and we were young in our twenties, and and um, it took about eighteen years of of uh, going to bed every night and wondering how in the world we actually paid our rent before audiobooks um, hit. You know, um, we did we didn't even find a a name for audiobook until nineteen ninety four. It was a committee of people who. Uh, decided that it would be an audiobook rather than a, rec a recorded book or a book on tape or whatever you know people were calling it all sorts of things. Well, that's fantastic. Thanks for that that backstory. And Sean Pratt. Sure. Uh, let's see here. Um, I was in Washington D.C. in 1994 doing a play at the Shakespeare Theater, and one of the actors in the cast was an audiobook narrator. Uh, David Hilder is his name. He's a playwright now in New York. And uh, I just, one day we were in the green room and I said, what do you do when you're not working? And he said, I do audiobooks." And I was like, wow, that's really cool. Um, I wasn't really interested at the time. I was just more curious. I was working off Broadway at the Pearl Theater as a company member and doing classical theater around the country. But uh, about two years later, I moved to Washington, D.C. And he introduced me to Grover Gardner, who is a real icon of our industry. And uh, I, I tell people that the main reason I got into audiobooks was uh, I was tired of hanging sheetrock because I had lined up all this theater work to see me through when I got to Washington and it all fell through. So I really wanted this thing to, you know, uh, come through. So I set up an appointment with him at his house. We talked and had a really great day long discussion about books and he cut a little demo and he said, I'll shop this around, maybe, you know, send it to a few people, see what happens. And Grover's a very good friend of mine, and I always joke that if he had known what was about to happen to him, he probably should have thrown me off his porch because I was so desperate to get something going. You know, uh, I saw the potential immediately just as a performer. You know, I'd grown up in show business like, oh, I could do this at home. I could make good money. It's really interesting. It's challenging work that I cajoled and I don't want to say bullied, but I, <laughs> I'd show up at his house at, you know, in the afternoon. Oh, I just happened to be in the neighborhood with this bottle of scotch. Would you like to have a sip? And let's talk about audiobooks. And I pestered the poor man to death until he finally contacted Blackstone and BOT, Books on Tape, and said, oh, for the love of God, give me something. This guy's driving me nuts. And uh, Blackstone and Books on Tape were my very first two clients. And I started narrating uh, at his place, he had some booths that he would rent out for time, and uh, that was the beginning of it. It was that was uh, 21 years ago, and 935 books. My goodness! Awesome. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> wow! Thank you so much. 
Um, my name is Stephen J. Cohen. Um, you can find me online at stephenjcohen.com or the new business name. It's now spokenrealms.com.net. And there will be a .org eventually. All those things are happening. It used to be under the title, Listen to a Book. And we're doing a whole sort of pivot rebranding with that. How I got started in the business. Um, <clears throat> I actually came up in this business. Um, well, I came up in stage and sound, actually. So my first professional work was, um, was well, where a lot of people in New York <clears throat> who, who would be trying to make it in the theater would have a day job working, you know, driving a cab or um, waiting tables. My day job was doing lights and sound. <clears throat> so I was auditioning part of the time and then I was behind either the light board or the soundboard, the other parts of the time. And so I've kind of been doing that work all the way through. Um, I did that on theater row and up into symphony space and did some work on selected shorts and some other pieces there before life kind of took me in lots of different directions. And maybe about, yeah, about nine years ago now could be 10 um, some people who I was still doing some sound editing for said, you know, we had a lot of fun when we would act with you on stage. Have you ever thought about getting back into getting back into acting and coming back to this side of the mic? And I did what I needed to do and asked people a lot of questions and said yes to a lot of things and slowly found my way into um, into working with some independent publishers on ACX and from there into some of the other publishers and, and built that out and slowly worked from there towards, um, towards becoming a publisher and distributor of, of, on my own. And that's what Listen to a Book and what is now Spoken Realms is about. Awesome. And finally, Scott Brick. When I got started in the business, mumble mumble years ago, um, I can tell you the day. It was June 10th, 1999, uh, when I did my first job at Dove Audio. It was a very different landscape. You could get in back in those days without doing a demo. You could just go in and audition for someone if you knew, you know, if you had some kind of connection to the people who were uh, doing the auditions. Um, a buddy of mine from UCLA that I played baseball with every Saturday, uh, Bob Westall, he uh, was working for... He was working for Stefan Rydnicki and Gabrielle DeCure, um, who now do Skyboat here in Los Angeles. They were um, running Dove Audio at the time. And so he got me an audition. And I thank God for Bob every day. I've taken him out to so many dinners. And, you know, I, I, I told <laughs> Bob, you, uh, you drink for free around me from now on because uh, I wouldn't have a career otherwise. Um, Stefan and Gabrielle gave me my first job. I did a couple of short stories for them. And that day, uh, Dan Musselman, it was uh, Dan Musselman who is the executive producer of Penguin Random House Audio here in Los Angeles. He was leaving Dove Audio. He used to work with Stefan and Gabriel, and uh, he had been hired away by this company called Books on Tape, which wound up being bought by Random House Audio. And uh, he said, hey, it's your first day, it's my last day, uh, I'm going off to, you know, make audiobooks for a new company gonna go build a studio, uh, why don't you give me a call? And he gave me his card and uh, I thank God for that. I have every day since because, uh, I don't know, eight, 850 some odd books, I've probably done easily over 500 of them have been for Dan. So thank you everyone for uh, your personal history getting involved with audiobooks and a little bit of an abridged history of the audiobook industry itself over the last 20 years. So. Now is really an interesting time for audiobooks because I feel like they're more popular than ever before. Everyone's listening um, on their commutes or when they're doing their errands at home, and everyone is interested in pursuing it from all walks of life. So I'm curious, from, based on your experience, how do you recommend someone new to the business try and get started today? Well, the first thing, I, I get an email, at least an email a week, if not more, um, from people literally around the world, uh, some who have uh, English as a second language even, who are interested. And I, I kept getting asked about this for years and years. And so finally about oh, maybe 10 years ago, maybe I guess, I made a little video on my YouTube channel 
uh, and on it I have what I call the test. So when people contact me, I say, go take the test, and if you pass, then contact me and we'll, we'll talk about something. And basically the test is, you know, get a book you like, set up a small, can, uh, a small space to work in, a confined space, um, and read out loud for two to three hours a day for 14 days straight. And, you know, and if you make a mistake, start the sentence over. If you hit a word you don't know how to pronounce, go look it up, you know, you, and, and read it to someone. Don't just mumble your way through it. And I say, if you can pass that, then you might have the temperament to be a, an audiobook narrator. Because I found over the years that not only in show business, but in audiobooks, it's not the talent factor that's, to me, the deciding thing. It's, it's their temperament. Can they direct themselves? Can they stay focused when they're working by themselves? Can they work in a confined space? I get emails all the time from people who've taken the test who say, thank you so much. Now you've inspired me. I'm going to go on to ACX and see what's there. But I also get emails from people saying, I took your test and you have absolutely positively convinced me that I never, ever, ever want to do this for a living. <laughs> and and I, feel, I feel like I've done a good service as a, as a coach. You know, I've saved them a lot of heartache and money. Um, and so... So that's what I do. That's what I do. And anyone expresses any interest. I'm like, go watch the video, mm -hmm. go take the test. Anybody else have a comment on that? Uh, yeah, I, this is Andy. I actually am in the process of selecting a small number of students to start from scratch with this fall because I put a, something on my Facebook page, my narrator page saying, you know, <laughs> I'm going to take a small number of students and here's how to apply and what to send me. And so the first test is actually, do they meet that deadline? <laughs> because we have to meet, you know, it's a deadline driven business. So if they can't meet a deadline for me, then they're not ready to put out a shingle and say, I really do this professionally. So I heard from a handful of people and actually two of them are like, uh, Deborah, I'm going to be sending them your way in short order. <laughs> they're like really amazing. Wow. Um, yeah, I was so impressed. I'm really excited to work with them. And another one um, is fine, I think, talent-wise, but was talking about wanting to sort of make extra money on the side doing audiobooks. And I, my perspective on things is that it's not an extra money on the side kind of endeavor. It takes so long to get any traction, to get a foot in the door, to get your name out there, that it just takes a higher level of commitment than that. So. Excellent. Deborah, any thoughts? Uh, yes. Um, Sean and Andy are absolutely amazing teachers and coaches, and I highly recommend them. Uh, we actually have a school as well, um, a Dion Institute, and uh, PJ Oakland is a teacher out here in Los Angeles. And uh, he does a great job uh, teaching intro, um, intermediate, and um, he does a dialect class and uh, He's just terrific, just terrific. So I, I, re I recommend that people that are new to the business, they really need to get into class. They really need, need a coach. Uh, they really need um, a, a business coach because there's a lot to this. And, um, you know, Andy's right. It's, it's, it takes a lot of hard work, um, you know, to get your foot in the door and to get rolling uh, it takes a, a a lot of effort, a lot of marketing effort, and a lot of um, you know going to uh, events and 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 being involved. It it really takes um, having a personal relationship with the different publishers and, and the different producers. It's not enough to just um, hang a shingle and or work off of the ACX system and think that you're. Uh, you're doing it. it. It just isn't. There's there's a lot of work involved. Nowadays, obviously, totally different landscape, and it is vital that you have a demo nowadays. My advice is to learn as much as you can before you go into the into the booth, because especially if you're coming at this from another avenue, a type of voiceover, um, you exercise different muscles in every different type. You know, I work with. DJs a lot, people who have spent their time in radio for decades. And, you know, they assume that they can just keep using those same muscles and those same skills when they do an audiobook demo. And it's totally different. So um, I would say, you know, it, it, whatever ability you're able to learn, 
Um, sometimes financially, you, know, you can't afford to get a coach, but there are so many free resources online, YouTube videos. Um, you can watch interview shows. VO Buzz Weekly is a, is a marvelous, marvelous gift to any kind of uh, voiceover artist, whether you want to get into audiobooks or promos or what have you. They interview professionals uh, in, in every, every aspect of voiceover. So you can watch a two hour interview, hour and a half video, an hour and a half of video of hearing people who do it talk about the craft, uh, then go into the booth and sit down and create your tracks. Uh, you know, uh, start, se start sending out submission emails, query letters basically. And uh, just one little word of advice, Make sure to link directly to the page with your demos. Don't go to your main page and then have them click again to get to the demos. You never want to be more than two clicks away from that person hearing your voice. Wow, that is really insightful and something I've never thought about before. <laughs> yeah, you, people lose so much interest so quickly. And the more clicks that you make them, you know, the more hoops you give them to jump through, the the quicker they're going to lose interest. So Scott, a lot of our listeners are new to the business. That's why we asked that first question. But a lot of the, the people that we talk to that are just coming in, look first to ACX as a way to sort of get their foot in the door, or maybe start in the business. Do you see ACX as still a viable option to either start in the business or even to continue a career in the business? I think, uh, and this goes contrary to my initial thoughts about ACX. When I first heard about ACX years ago, and I think a lot of um, veteran narrators, let's say, um, um, people who are already into their career, a lot of us shied away. Jeffrey Caper, when I remember taking him out for a, a drink afterwards to say thank you, and he gave me the best advice. He said, if you are not using ACX as a, as a way to put out royalty share books, you are leaving money on the table. So I have, uh, I have absolutely revised my thinking on it. Um, when I took the advice that Jeffrey Caver gave me that night, it had an immediate financial impact on my career and my bank account. Um, I think <laughs> absolutely a, a viable way to get in. But, and I say this as anything derogatory about ACX, I say the same thing to people who work for one company all the time, even if it's a major publisher, always have an exit strategy. And by that, I don't mean stop working for them. By exit strategy, I mean a way to transition from working full-time in this realm as you're cutting your teeth and getting your sea legs under you, whatever metaphor you want to use. Once you've done that and you're ready to work with the major publishers, the independent producers, what have you, always have a goal in mind about how to transition out. And um, absolutely, you can break in at ACX and you can make your career and your finances thrive on ACX. Stephen, how about you? We were talking about new people to the business uh, approaching ACX as a way to break in or get their foot in the door. Is that still a viable option? Or is ACX still a viable option in general as a way to, to promote your audiobook business? And what other ways are there for narrators to seek out work for themselves? What I've noticed over time with ACX is that in the beginning, when the platform first opened up, there was, um, there was a huge backlog of demand that simply had no place to go. Couldn't figure out what was going on, and suddenly there was this marketplace. So there was a lot of really high value um, product that suddenly became available, and it was like panning for gold during the gold rush. Whereas now, anyone who looks at ACX and is purely, um, purely looking at it as a place to audition is missing at least half of what's really there. Um, whether or not the, what's sitting on ACX right now is something that you think is worth auditioning for, what ACX gives you by having an account is your own personal uh, publishing platform. So you getting out and going to things like writers conferences or other things and being the one audiobook narrator in the room, you get to actually, you know, have the conversation. And when the person says, and how are we going to distribute this? You have the answer in your back pocket, you know, so 
yeah, there are other things that are coming out now. And, and part of that is, um, is the, the longer and the, lo the longer that it goes on where Audible is the largest player, the more people start talking about alternatives. But also the longer that goes on, the harder it becomes for somebody to build an alternative of scale something that can handle that. And we're seeing some of that with, with Kobo coming on the scene and we're seeing Findaway, which for a long time was a business to business back end system. Um, you know, they were responsible for a long time for moving audiobooks outside of Audible. In many cases, uh, Findaway was responsible for how those books made it into the libraries or make it, make it into the little kiosk, you know, in, in, in a truck stop and all different things like that. Findaway was responsible for a lot of those other pieces and now they're turning around to, to be a place with their voices division where they're trying to reach out to authors. So it's going to be interesting looking in the next couple of years as these different alternatives start to crop up because the the talk when you talk to independent authors is um is about what alternatives are there to um to amazon the parent company behind audible um that's really what i i see is that when people simply look at acx as a place to audition they really are missing most of the value that's there one thing one thing that often does happen though is people will come to me and they'll say, I want to do this through what, what, what was listened to a book. And of course, as of today, you've probably many of you have seen this, uh, we're going through a rebranding and moving the content into uh, under the new business name, which is Spoken Realms. And um, the audio production network is, is what was listened to a book. And if you go to, if you still have old links to listen to a book.com that still works, but you can go over to um, SpokenRealms.com, SpokenRealms.net and see what's going on there as the content is being migrated and things show up. But often people will come to me with a project that's actually more appropriately an ACX project. And they're kind of surprised when I turn them back towards ACX because I understand some more of the ins and outs of the, pro of, of the platform and can point out where by doing something else, they may be leaving important information, data, money, something on the table. And, you know, the last thing I would like to do is just, you know, you come to me and I, and I take your project and then six months down the road, you figure out there was something better. If there's a better fit, I'd rather, I'd rather focus on that. Um, so really, um, what was listened to a book that's now Spoken Realms, we're focused a little bit more on projects you cannot do through ACX. So whether that means you're working with, um, uh, material that is not available as an ebook that you can claim as your own. So that could be you want to do a public domain work. It could mean that you have a script that is not originally um, a book and you're trying to get it into the same marketplace. It could be that you want to do something that doesn't fit for a different reason, like you'd like to do a dual narration piece, but you'd like to do it as a royalty share, and ACX doesn't have a mechanism to pay two narrators. So all of those kinds of projects are the kinds of things that can be done through Spoken Realms, through the audio production network, um, that you cannot do through the other platform. Personally, with, with what I'm doing and how I like to work, it, it made more sense to try to, you know, the, this, you know the, the, uh, the, the square peg in the round hole metaphor. Uh, when I built the system that I built, I built a square hole. So that way you don't have to try to shove that square peg into the round <laughs> hole. So when somebody comes to me, if, if they've got a round peg, I say, you really want to go over there. I would say... If you go on to ACX right now and look under just the wide open, how many producers have listed themselves there, it's, it's like 46,000 producers, um, which is really, really daunting. But then you start to look at the samples that people have uploaded and the amount of not following directions that weeds out, I don't even know, maybe a third of those people right off the bat is stunning. Like people who put an, a car commercial demo up on ACX or they're reading something and you can hear dogs barking in the background or you know um, there's just not a sense of market with a lot of the people who've who've listed themselves there so you can really give yourself an advantage by thinking about 
who's looking for narrators, not car, not car companies, you know, um, and what are they looking for? And what is your, if you work with a coach to know your brand, your niche, your sound, then you can actually leverage your ACX profile in conjunction with networking with authors who write in the genre that you might be interested in. Uh, then they have a reason to go look at your profile and not just the entire ACX site and go, eh. Excellent. Sean or Deborah, any thoughts? That's well, really good advice. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> well, the other thing I would say, one of the things that I, that I do personally and that I teach my students and I've taught, I've used to teach uh, classes on the business of show business for years at acting schools um, and with acting groups. And I said, uh, you know, it says, you know, the, the, your question is, is it still vi a viable option? Well, that implies that you have a goal in mind. And a lot of people get into show business without a specific goal. And I, I stress to my students that they pick, I always pick five goals for the year. And they, I work those goals throughout the year. And then at the end of the year, I can then see, well, how did I do this year? You know, and that's, that's the only yardstick I use for my own success. I don't judge it against anybody else. And so, but what I try to tell them is that oftentimes when they get to ACX, they may not know what ACX can do for them. They may have an overblown sense of what its possibilities are. And I try to sort of lower those, I, I, especially with my narrators who come from a performance background. I tell them initially they should be thinking of ACX like um, if you were an actor doing summer stock theater or black box theater where you're going to work your butt off, you're not going to make any money but you need the resume credit, the experience, the connections. And that's just part of the learning curve. You know, I, I tried to, you know, I said, yeah, go ahead and audition for the per finished hour stuff, but just know that your, your recording and your experience level now will be going head to head with someone who's got 30, 40, 50, 60 books on there. So, you know, um, you should be thinking about, in my opinion, now granted, you want to do books that have a, are of a certain quality. You're not going to stick anything that comes your way. But you should be, to me, more focused initially, if you're a raw beginner, on getting the experience. You know, so y y some of those books may not be, uh, you know, they, they ain't all Hemingway, but at least you'll have the experience. And so if you start out looking at ACX th in that direction, and then as you get more savvy as a narrator, savvy as a business person, and savvy about the site, then you can begin to start picking and choosing and navigating uh, the, the possibilities that are out there. But initially, you know, think of it more as, as that, you know, like I said, working in a black box theater in Brooklyn for 10 bucks a, a show or something. It's, it's a learning experience more than it is a, a revenue stream. Well, excellent points, everyone. It really helps kind of, um, so apparently, yes, ACX is still a very viable, if misunderstood, <laughs> option for people who don't realize the potential value it could have for them in their audiobook business. And so, Stephen, I love that you went into such detail because very often you find that um, as narrators grow their careers, they often become publishers in their own right. And so a lot of people assume that, like other areas of voiceover, audiobook is all about the performance. It's all about the voice. But the truth is, is that there are a lot of other skills involved, particularly technical skills. So I'm curious just how much technical skill is required to start and is it really essential to have a home studio for people trying to get involved with audiobooks? Yes, unless you live in New York or LA. Simple enough. <laughs> I know. Anyone else want to weigh in? <laughs> All right, let's phrase it a different way. How many of, of well, I guess in this case, Andy and, um, and Sean and Scott, how many of you actually still work from home and, and what percentage of your work is done in your home studio versus at a, at a production house or a publisher? Um, well, I, I don't live in New York or LA, <laughs> so I have done all but two of my books from my home studio. Yeah, from my experience um, of the 930 something books I've done, uh, probably a handful, maybe five in 20 years, because it was just an accident of geography. I became an audiobook narrator based out of Washington, D.C., which is arguably one of the nexus points of audiobook narration because of Library of Congress and Learning Ally and that they needed narrators there. And out of that was the natural pool of talent for uh, the audiobook companies when they were looking for home-based studio narrators. So I started out 
I started out working in a studio from the, uh, my own booth from the very beginning. So I'm really, a, a, you know, an autodidact. I taught myself everything I needed to know over, you know, uh, the successes and failures of doing that on your own. So you do need a, you, you do need it for that reason, because that's also where the industry is headed. It has been heading for many years now. The other thing too is this gets back to say like demos on ACX, you know, you, you do need to have a quality studio. So the, the, the sound booth itself has to have meet a certain standard. The equipment needs to be a certain standard and there's ways to talk with people and get that to that standard. Uh, but also things like demos, you know, whereas in commercial VO, you go into a studio and they do all this really cool, sexy stuff with music and sound effects. And you have a really great producer who puts it all together for you. In audiobooks, ultimately you need to be doing your demos on your own mic in your own space, because that's what they're hiring in the end. Because if you went to an expensive studio in New York to get a really cool audiobook demo put together, you know, and then suddenly you, the quality of your studio where you do the book is radically different, it's a bit of bait and switch. So yes, having your own studio is, is part and parcel uh, with the industry, and except, like Andy said, if you're in LA or New York. I never advise somebody to leap into a voiceover career and first thing to do is get a home studio. I always say, test the waters. Make sure you have enough work to justify this expense because, you know, depending on how, you know, intricate or detailed and really involved you want to get, you're going to be spending a thousand, five thousand. I know people who spend a lot more than that on their boots. Mm -hmm. And why do that if, you know, you don't have the right skill set or, um, you know, you're, you're, you're the best in the biz, but nobody will listen to your demo. I mean, I hate the idea of spending all that money and, it, and it, you know, your studio lying fallow, basically. So what I always say is, even though it might mean um, less profit up front, if you're getting, you know, your per finished hour fee and it's, you know, flat, they can't, you know, there's no leeway, um, there's no wiggling room that you spend part of it and you find, uh, uh, you know, the cheapest, best option for you to use somebody else's studio. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you use part of that per hour fee, uh, per finished hour fee to do that. Um, and then when you start getting those phone calls and emails a lot more often and the publishers or whomever you're dealing with is knocking on your door a lot more, especially when they start, uh, uh, making inquiries like, hey, I'm curious, um, do you have a home studio? You ever thought about putting in a home studio? Let that be your sign. Yes, go out. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's the same way that I always say, you know, uh, people ask me what kind of microphone, you know, how, how uh, um, you know, how much should they spend? Should they get a really, a pop for a really expensive one up front? Mm -hmm. Say, get one that it makes you sound professional. And then at some point in your career, when you want to be taken seriously, when you want to be taken seriously as, a, as somebody who's, you know, moving on to the next level and working for the, you know, for the majors, um, that you invest, you know, more. And, you know, you invest a little more into a better microphone. Um, you know, again, I just, I hate the idea of somebody going to a great deal of expense up front. And the same goes for the technical side of things. Mm -hmm. It depends on how steep the learning curve is. If, you know, I, I know just enough about, you know, the technical aspects of audio to be dangerous. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I knew that the learning curve, that, that's not where my skill set is. So, you know, what I want to do, I want to rely on the people who really know their stuff. I want to rely on the best in the business. And there's a part of me that's just like, hey, you know what, I'm an American. Uh, I get a lot of benefit by being a member of society and I don't want it all to go one way. I don't want to just take the benefits. Um, I want to give some too. So I hire editors and I hire proofers and I hire engineers. Um, you know, I can, I can, if I focus on what I know how to do rather than spending money on training uh, or spending time on, you know, watching a ton of YouTube videos, if you want to, by all means, do it. I know a lot of narrators who do, and they thrive on it. Simon Vance loves playing around, you know, and, and doing his own editing. I, that guy, God, that's an extended yawn for me. So I 
I, it makes me happy that I'm hiring people and I'm putting money into the economy, that I'm helping my, you know, my associates, my, my, my peers, the people who really know their stuff. I think it, it is all dependent on the person. What is your learning curve? What is your level of interest? Also, what is your level of fear? I, I work with a lot of retirees who are trying to, as they come to take my classes, they want to reinvent themselves and they don't want to have to spend a lot of time or money because maybe they don't have a lot of, you know, either one of those. I said, well, then don't. Do, do as much as you want and try working with others to, uh, to get you, you know, to the next step. Yeah, and to add on to where Scott was going there, um, and this is an open question for the room, how many people in this room um, knew how to fix a car or build a car the day they got their driver's license? <laughs> <laughs> Still don't. <laughs> right. So, so let's, you know, and this is the thing that most people think about. They think, oh, I'm going to do everything. Scott's really, I mean, I really, that's the right way to go about it. Um, you know, when, when I first moved to the area that I'm in and I was doing some of this work, first thing I did was I contacted every studio in the area to see if anyone had actual experience either recording voiceover or spoken word. I found a couple of studios that were semi-local. At least one had ISDN who said that, sure, I could advertise that I'm an ISDN talent and this is how I schedule time in the studio. And I work with him on and off to this day, not because I need that anymore. I, I've got you know, stuff set up here, but because we've become friends and we, we send work towards each other at this point. So there's that component. And a lot of people make, make the mistake of trying to to figure this all out at once. Mm -hmm. And then when they go back to listen to their early work, they wind up in with that cringeworthy, oh my God, oh, you know, they, they have that feeling about what, what's happening there. Um, the, and, and this is one of the things. Um, so when I, I, I've called ACX a pay to play but then people point out to me, you don't pay a fee, so why do I call it a pay-to-play? I call it a pay-to-play because um, a royalty share, in a lot of ways, is them asking you to gamble whether or not you're going to make money. You know, it's, it's a stock market. And so you're paying your time. So you're paying your time. time, right, your time and, and futures based upon your labor. And so people say, well, it's not costing me anything up front. They're not understanding that part. Um, there's a lot of people who will do their first book without pre-reading it and then only find out in chapter 19 that the character they've been doing with that high squeaky voice is described as having a rich baritone. <laughs> and they have to go back and re-record because, the, you know, because there are things like that. Um, so finding local studios, going into your local libraries and, and getting to know the reference librarians who are incredibly helpful because when you need to look up pronunciate, these are, those are people who look up things for a living <laughs> and that doesn't cost you anything. And neither of those things actually cost you anything. And when you are working alone, when you start working by yourself and you're going to plan to work in a padded room talking into a little stick, you need to create those outside connections to the world. And so now I, there's two local libraries near me. And when I walk in, about half of the reference librarians know who I am. And they'll ask me, what book are you working on? And because I need pronunciations of local names of things like that. And, and they're happy to help. So there are ways to plug in to the community around you to get things done. And, and, and um, again, going back to the, I didn't know how to fix a car when I first got my driver's license. Why, when I get my first microphone, would I be expecting to do that? So absolutely, find a local studio, do your, your jobs there, but invest at that point in a very basic kit, um, kit and, and actually talk to those studio people as well as the online forums, people that you trust, anyone who will talk to you about equipment, and you'll be able to get kitted out in professional equipment at home that you can use for quick auditions because the thing that a lot of voiceover people don't really remember is that you don't need the perfect space for most of your auditions. 
you need the perfect space for your job. There's an understanding that the audition is, you know, they're listening for your, your delivery. They're not listening at that point to say, ooh, this, his studio's noisy. If you're the right person, they'll hire you. And, you know, and you're pointing out that you're going to be recording that in another studio. So having a, an audition grade studio, let's call it that, at home when you start, is a lot cheaper than like running out and trying to figure out if you need a, a $10,000, $8,000, $12,000 booth in your home. Can I also, uh, there's something else I'd love to point out because uh, the idea that our fellow narrators, our brothers and sisters, I think are being taken advantage of in one particular way and it drives me crazy. Um, this isn't a, you know, a thing about the technical aspect of audio and yet nevertheless it is something that... Uh, can so easily be outsourced and uh, solve uh, uh, one of your problems. Um, uh, some publishers, they will have, you know, they've got, uh, they'll, they'll offer a job, let's say they're offering uh, uh, $200 per finished hour for, for a book. Okay, great. You take the job. Then they tell you, oh, you know what? If you want to do all the research yourself and handle <laughs> that part of it, um, we'll make it 250 or 225. Let's say, let's say it's 250. And what do we do? Like lemmings, you know, like sheep. Nah, you know, we go, great, I want that extra 50 bucks. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what a sucker's bet that is. Oh, my God. And I understand. I, 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 my friends are, you know, the publishers in some cases are my friends who are making me this offer. And I'm, and I'm looking at them going, oh, my God, you're so taking advantage of us. Because think about it, right? You're getting, let's say, 50 extra dollars per hour, a per finished hour. You know, if you're making $50 per finished hour to do the research, but you're making $200 finished per finished hour to do the narrating, why don't you pay somebody $25 an hour to do that research for you, and you make $200 an hour in that same hour on a different book? It's outsourced. Please, God, you know, I haven't done my own research in close to 10 years now because I can make more doing what I know how to do. And Deborah, you work with producers and narrators within your award-winning studio. Uh, what percentage of your work is done with um, narrators in-house versus in their home studios? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, you know, we're in LA. We're in LA. We've got uh, two studios in LA. Uh, one has four booths, and the other has five. We run them seven days a week, double shift. So we're doing, you know, quite a bit of work in our studios. You know, but Sean is absolutely right. The industry is moving towards home narrators. Uh, of all the, the work that I receive from clients all over the world, you know, 80% of it, I'm still hiring a home narrator to do the work in their own home booths. 20% uh, of the work that I'm doing is done here in my studios or in studios in New York, London, Toronto, big cities. Authors wanting to read their own books are still coming in the studios, they obviously aren't going to have their own home booths, you know, celebrities, um, you know, people in, you know, actors, like Broadway actors, we hire a lot of those. Uh, so, so, you know, th those people are, are recording in, in studios in, in New York or here in LA. Um, but yeah, if, if somebody's serious about doing audiobooks and they don't live in Los Angeles or New York or London, they really you know, have to have a home booth. It just, it just is the way it is. Yeah. And I would also add that um, I have done shorter form voiceover work. And, you know, when I was doing a two or three minute commercial and my neighbor was using a chainsaw, I could, you know, quick fit it in when he went in to have a drink of water. But if I'm trying to do an eight hour book, which takes me the better part of a week to finish, and my neighbor's having a chainsaw party, I got a problem. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. For sure. So we talked about doing work in a production house like Dion Audio in LA. How does a narrator who's looking to partner with such a business uh, contact them? Or what's the best way to market yourselves to production houses? Yeah, in regards to production houses and, and publishers in general, everybody on their web, all the publishers have on their websites exactly how you can become a narrator for them and work for them. Every single publisher 
operates differently. Um, it, sometimes that can be frustrating for actors, narrators to, to navigate, but it's really, really clear on every single publisher's website how to contact them, how to upload your samples, how, how, to, you know, how they work, how they hire. I'm really clear about how I do it. Uh, all they would have to do is email me, Debra, D-E-B-R-A, at DionAudio.com. And, uh, you know, we're, we have a very clear set of instructions on how uh, people don't, you know, there's kind of a bit of a myth about ACX. People seem to think that they have to have some sort of a bunch of credits in order to get my attention or the attention of the publishers. It's absolutely not true. Um, and it's sometimes it's really frustrating because um, somebody will have, will work really hard and, and get 60 credits or something crazy, some big body of work on ACX. And, and we'll do all these, you know, kind of um, royalty share kind of things and do a bunch of free work and thinking that if they do a bunch of free work that they're going to somehow build up all these credits and get my attention because they have a lot of credits. Um, I, I feel sorry for people who are misguided that way because I would have listen to their sample without any credits to their name and I would have decided whether I like them or not based on their sample. So, um, you know, for, I, I don't know about other people and, and whether they feel like they need your, you to have a bunch of credits or not, but I can tell you from my perspective, I do not. I, I know what I like. Uh, I know within, you know, a few seconds of hearing you read, you know, if I, if I want to hire you or not, you know, it, it's, it's that simple for me. Excellent. So uh, sort of going on that question, Deborah, do you critique demos for people who might not like, who are just asking for feedback, not necessarily being, uh, wanting to be hired by you? I, I've never done that really um, because people that are contacting me want me to hire them. So, um, <laughs> Well, I, I do critique a lot of people's demos, but but not for the fun of it. Uh, or, oh, or, I see. So everyone's pretty much, is this hireable? Is this bookable? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they're contacting me, they want a job. And, 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 and rightly so. I mean, we're, we're, we're the world's largest, you know, producers of audiobooks. You know, I've, I've, I stopped counting. I, I, I had produced 15,000 titles like four or five years ago, and I just stopped counting. It's, I mean, we do thousands a year. It's, it's, you know, so they're high, if they're, you know, calling me, you know, they're looking, they're looking for a job and, and I don't blame them. They should be calling me. So what, what is sort of the, the etiquette for contacting a production house or a publisher? I mean, you mentioned that they all have their own idiosyncrasies, but since you are a producer yourself, what do you look for when someone reaches out? I'm just simply looking for somebody to write me an email that says, hi, I'm, I'm looking for a job and uh, how do I go about working with you? And, uh, and we write back, you know, very clear instructions on exactly what they need in order to, to be asked to be part of the roster. And then, uh, you know, once they're, once they're asked to be part of the roster, we just, we start, you know, looking at them as, as a possibility of, of someone who can be hired um, somebody has to be on the roster in order to get hired because uh, it's just too complicated for us otherwise to remember who you are and to, you know, uh, uh, it's just it's just better for us. We have five casting people uh, working, f you know, it, here, and um, that's what they do 40 hours a week, you know. Uh, so um, it's just it's too hard for us to to uh, you know to meet somebody at a party or whatever and to remember who they are um it's it's it, it makes much more sense for us that if they you know give us their headshot their bio their demo you know uh then once we have a marker for them a banner then uh you know then then all then the relationship part starts you know that that's the um you know, I saw somebody at a mixer or uh, somebody participated in the APA speed dating or, you know, some other form that, you know, where I, where I uh, somehow see their face over and over and, and uh, they become ingrained in my, uh, in my memory and, and, um, you know, hiring them and, and for, for them to be able to stand out. And that's what, you know, Sean had talked about your brand and, and, um, 
you know, who, who you, you know, no, Andy had said, you know, knowing who you are and, and how to market yourself and, you know, what your brand is. And, and that's all, all true. You know, you have to stand out somehow. Absolutely. You, you can approach anybody. Uh, you, the narrator, be bold, you know, go confidently in the direction of your dreams, live the life you've imagined. Um, let's put it this way. Think about it from this perspective. Every single one of those publishers and every single one of those independent producers, Deb can tell you, you know, Deb DeYoung can tell you that they are always looking for new talent. Always. They may not have the time based on the, uh, let's say, the, the, the budgets, the timetables, the deadlines that they're dealing with on a certain project to go find somebody right now, but they are always on the lookout. It is always on their radar. It is always on their radar. Find the new guy. Find the new woman. And you basically you do so by by writing a query letter do a google search query letter um i used to write them when i was writing magazine articles all the time and i had to approach a new publisher and i would basically say this is who i am this is what i've done you know attached are some clips of thing you know attached are some some articles I've written in the past, or in this case, you know, you know, you'll you'll see a link here to books that I have narrated already, and those obviously are ones that you've done on ACX or you know whomever you 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 start your career with, and you say I think I would be a good fit because, and you point out that you know, um, well Blackstone Audio they don't do a whole lot of young adult, they do some, but they do a whole lot of you know. Uh, uh, whatever it is, you, you point out, you know, I've noticed you do a lot of romance. I've noticed you do a lot of erotica. If you're talking to a random house, you say, I know that listening library, I know that your listening library imprint does, you know, by far the most young adults books in the industry. Mm -hmm. And you find these things out by doing the research. And you basically, you're showing them when you send an email like that or a letter, if you want to get old school, you're showing them not only that with your links, hey, I do what you do. When you, when you show them that you know about their company and you've you know, taken the time to research it, that you know about the industry. You're basically saying, I've done what you do. I do what you do for a living and I can help you. Look at all these other people that I've, that I've already helped. It is in your best interest for me to help you too. That's, you know, that's the subtext of your letter. Write a very good query letter. Have somebody read it. Um, you know, vet it for you, make sure that, you know, your spelling and grammar are, are perfect because you know what, this is the publishing industry and, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, start, start submitting. Now you may not get traction with Simon and Schuster. Uh, I'll tell you, I've been doing this for mm, coming up on 18 years now. For the first 15 years of my career, they wouldn't answer my phone calls. I should say that. I mean, they were always very polite, but, but they were like, yeah, we're not looking for anybody right now. And then finally, I started working with them. Remember, the same thing happened with Harper. I only started working for them less than a year ago. Hmm. Remember that every person that you were approaching, every company that you're approaching, always keep in mind, this is still an audition. And when you do your first, when they give you your first chance, whether it's a, you know, one of the voices in a, in a multi-voice recording or a short story in a collection that they're doing, whatever it is, remember that that first job, you may have booked the job, but you haven't booked the publisher yet. You haven't booked the room. You haven't booked the casting person. They're waiting to find out how you execute the chance that they've given you. And I, I, I always say, keep that in mind with every single new person that you're approaching. And I think if you go into it with that intent and with that knowledge, um, things usually go well. They go definitely go better. Fabulous points. Wonderful. Uh, any, any thoughts on that, Stephen? Um, yeah, I, I think when you're when you're doing that outreach, uh, I, I've heard people do this, and I don't even people have a hard time really celebrating the work that they've already done. They tend to minimize, and so writing that query letter can be a very hard thing. Um, but I want to point out that if you look at any ACX book, not a single one of them claims that ACX is the publisher. ACX is simply the platform in that case where, where you as a narrator have connected with a rights holder and the book has gotten done. So you've done zero books for ACX. You've done a whole bunch of books for some independent, independent publishers. Um, 
And so if you've done 12 books for eight different rights holders, then describe it that way. Talk about how you've done something for this um, this indie horror label and for this LGBT um, label that that does mysteries and other things like that. You know, realize that all ACX did was introduce you to somebody who needed a book to get done. You've done zero books for ACX. You've done, you have done books for these independents. And yes, when you talk to people, you're going to do that um, with as much confidence you know, you, your portfolio is you and you want to be hired. This isn't about you being a shrinking violet. This is, and, but this is not, this is about you saying here, here's what I can do. And here's how, what I can do can be a service for you. Andy and Sean, any advice on approaching publishers specifically? Um, uh, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a complicated thing. I mean, I would, I mean, you know, um, every just as Deborah has her philosophy, other publishers are different. You know, there was a, I won't name names, but there at the recent APAC conference, there was a, a casting director at one of the forums who said, don't send me anything. I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to hear, I don't want emails from people. I don't want anything. And you're like, well, how do you find new talent? Right. You know, you have to be, Deborah's taking the, the, the in my opinion, the correct approach, which is, you know, I come from a th I come from the theater background. I grew up in the theater, and like it or not, if you're in casting as a if for a theater or 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 casting office in general, you're going to be inundated with talent trying to reach out and trying to say, "Hey, I'm new. T pay attention to me." You know, I I think I could be an asset for you in some way, and so you have to be open. That's just it comes with the territory. It comes with the job description. So that being said learning about marketing and advertising the nuances of that about putting together a resume about showing them some of your reviews about having a very good demo to, to showcase your talents learning the, the nuances of that are tricky uh you know it's not something i can answer in a uh, in a, just a, in a quick response to this question it takes finesse you know it takes time to learn how to package yourself your brand what are you special at and so on but all those pieces are out there you can learn all of that stuff not only from coaches but it's free on youtube and and on the web there 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 are videos and articles and things you can actually spend the time to le read and learn from that teach you how to craft an image how to craft a good resume or a good demo and how to get it in front of the right people I um I have a, a like don't do this type story that's mm -hmm. not a very long story. Um, I was at a networking event, an industry event, and I was speaking with uh, somebody who hires narrators from a particular publishing company, and we were talking about something I had produced that he listened to that had not anything to do with what he produces, just something he personally likes, and we were talking about some funny parts of the book and blah blah blah. And all of a sudden, someone came and broke into our conversation. So there's, there's already like lack of sensitivity to the fact that two people are having a conversation and just started talking about himself and shoving the business card in the guy's face and talking about, well, I want to do business books. I want to do all these business books. And I, I just wanted to say, do you realize that the person you're talking to never ever produces any business books and if you had done your homework <laughs> you would not this would not be a connection you're trying to make that's he's in a totally other part of the industry and this is not a good match for you and you made a really bad first impression because you just interrupted a conversation that we were having so it's and that man's like, name was sean pratt that's no. right <laughs> <laughs> It, it's like if, if we were at some kind of like, uh, yeah, I didn't want to, I didn't want to blow his cover. He was having a bad day. Thanks a lot, Andy. He's so Real. considerate. So <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks I a wasn't lot. saying it was you. It was them. <laughs> he does do a lot of business books. So like, I guess what, if you go to a networking thing, like pretend it's dating, right? And if you see two people talking, like, don't break in and start French kissing that one other person. Like, you know, it's like. It's just, you know, common sense, like they're having a conversation, wait your turn, like, and who is that person? Do you, do you need to meet them? You should, I, the first networking event that I went to 
there's this summertime thing that's a lot of fun. And the first time I went to it, the host of the event sends out the guest list the night before. And you better believe I was on Audible looking up all these people. What do they record? You know, I was completely stalking people. (laughs) And um, what I found was that there was somebody who narrated a book set in the town where my daughter was born in China. And it was like, oh my gosh, I read that book. I love that book. So now I can talk to that person about that book. And there's one person I can talk to tomorrow. So the theme is it's not different than than marketing yourselves in any other business. Right. Do your homework. Be savvy. Yeah. 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 And I love that um, there you had such a proactive approach to it because yeah, I mean, with any new business endeavor, there's a level of unconscious incompetence where you don't know what you don't know, but there really is so much research and sort of building of a skill set behind the scenes that you can do before you make a fool of yourself like that. So what I'm curious about is because some of you either work with students or hire narrators or do both, uh, what kind of skills or mindsets do you look for in a narrator or a student? What I'm looking for is uh, temperament. I always, I always interview my, when someone reaches out to me, I have them fill out a questionnaire and I review it first. And then I, and if I see, um, uh, I'm looking for a background, preferably with some level of performance. Um, because I mean, like it or not, performers just do better as narrators where they have an acting background of some kind uh, as a general, as a general statement. But I like to, I always interview my potential students. I want to get a feel for them. I also tell them what to expect when they work with me. I'm a strategic coach. I'm not a tactical coach. Um, a tactical coach, you can learn a lot from a, tacti- a good tactical coach. Someone like, uh, like Johnny Heller is an excellent tactical coach. Uh, Scott Brick is too. Uh, isn't that right, Scott? God, John Pratt, you are a master of the transition. I, I tell you what I do. Uh, what I look for when I'm um, when I'm basically auditioning talent, trying to figure out you know who would be a good fit. I don't do a ton of it, but what I do, I want to make sure that you know. Um, obviously, it's the right voice for the authorial voice. Does it match? And is when I listen to somebody's stuff. I I listen to several samples and I make sure that their style changes with each author. Um, because every author has a unique authorial voice and we, you know, we shift what we do to match it. You know, my version of, um, of, uh, the red badge of courage shouldn't sound like the Nelson DeMille books that I do, right? They're both Mm -hmm. fiction, but they are by no means the same kind of fiction. So, uh, you know, the vampire detective series that I did for Blackstone, the Charlie Houston books, they don't sound like any other books that I did. (laughs) So, um, I basically look for, and I can see it in when I'm working with a student in the uh, in the studio in the classroom, mm-hmm. um, and I can hear it when I listen to samples. I know when a narrator is connected, when the narrator, the you know the person I'm working with or listening to, has connected to the text. Because you know what, it is axiomatic when we connect to the text, the listener does. It's uh, uh, 10 times out of 10, 100 out of 100. And that's the moment where you reach them and where, where we, it becomes personal for us. And I always listen for that. Is, is the sample that they've sent me, you know, does it show that? I think we need to pay attention to that when we're clicking. When we're, I think we need to pay attention to that when we're choosing the samples that we put up, you know, for streaming on our website. Um, that it's a section of the book that really choked us up or that we really connected to and were able to make it funnier because, oh God, this has happened to me. Because <laughs> it's those moments that make people go, oh wow. And the very first time this ever happened was with uh, Alex Hyde White. I knew I wanted to work with him because in class one day, he read um, um, an exchange between, um, in a book about Truman Capote and um, uh, there was somebody in his life, I wanna say that he called Big Mama. And he said, um, um, Big Mama said, I love you, Truman. He says, no, you don't. Big Mama said, no, Truman, I absolutely love you. And, and he said, no, you don't. You can't. She says, what do you mean I can't? And he says, because nobody can love me. And he did it. And he was so, God, he just connected to it. I, I don't know how to, and, and I don't want to 
imitate it. But I went, mm -hmm. oh my God. And I gasped when I listened to it because that was the moment. And I knew that when he said that, he was remembering a time in his life when he'd felt like that. Because I'm telling you, everybody who hears that line remembers a time in their life when they felt unable to be loved, unworthy of love. And I went, that's the moment. He connected, great. I want to connect with him. I want to work with him. <laughs> and Stephen? Um, in, in my case, when I've had people coming to me, I've had more success um, casting people whose work I'm more familiar with than just their demo sample. Um, and sometimes it may, it may be that I have only heard the demo sample, but then I've actually had enough interactions with the person that I have a sense of who they are. Because sometimes you can have a, a really wonderful demo, but it's hard, to, but sometimes that person has a hard time delivering on a regular basis what they delivered that one day in the studio with the director right there with them. Um, a good example of a wonderful match that, that works in this way is not a, a case where I was casting a project that came to me, but I had listened to Johnny Heller's um, The Education of Little Tree, which uh, done, done with Crossroad Press, it was beautifully done, it was just so amazing. And uh, the next day after that was done and it was reflecting upon how that story went, I just kept saying to myself, he would do a wonderful Huckleberry Finn. Hmm. And so the next time I was in a place where I could, I could mention that, I, I reached out to him and I, and I said it, and he thanked me for it. And about nine months later, he said, I really want to do that Huckleberry Finn. Nice. So we, right, so we made it happen. Um, and so what will happen for me is it's either in, in, in direct interactions with people or it's the fact that i'm an avid listener of audiobooks myself and so i've had authors contact me to help get their stuff done and i start running through people in my head who i've listened to who feel like they would fit the project so in a lot of ways i'm doing that work the same way scott is because the you know the memory of those feelings is like ooh, i've really got to call you know, Sarah Mala Christensen, I really have to call Tim Campbell, you know, so it's, it's when you hear about the project and the passion of the project from the rights holders point of view, sometimes that right fit of a narrator will just come back up because of the direct experience of having experienced their performance. Yeah. And so the idea is that a tactical coach deals with what they have right in front of them, okay? You're doing the read. They say, do this, try this, try this, do a different thing. And that's not how I work. I work as a strategic coach. My stuff is about, here's the concept. Here it ties it to the material. Now go away, and you have to teach it to yourself. You know, I walk you through that and answer questions and give them examples. But it's, I come from the school of thought that you only really learn in something when you have to suffer through it on your own, as it were. And so when I talk with them, I'm giving them a heads up about what to expect when they're going to work with me. And I can tell immediately whether or not they're going to be recept uh, receptive to that. The other thing I'm looking for is uh, a certain level of temperament, uh, a realistic outlook about what they could be doing, how long it's going to take. I get th this question a lot, like, well, if I work really hard, you know, do you think I'll be making X amount of dollars in a year? And my response is always the same, which is this is show business. There is nothing that is certain. And if you actually encounter somebody who tells you a dollar figure, then you should put your wallet in your pocket and get the heck out of there because they're about to scam you. You know, there is, you can work six months and, and make a fair amount of money or work six years and, and just limp along. There is no structure. And I want to make sure they know that going in. I want to, you know, align their preconceptions with reality and also introduce them to the way I teach. And then, um, I guess lastly, it's just a matter of, of temperament. You know, do, they ha do I feel like they have the temperament not only to work with me, but to hang in there uh, and do this? Uh, it's, it, I keep coming back to that word, but I've just been in show business a long time, and talent is not the ultimate arbiter of your success. It really is about that tenacity that temperament, can you hang in there? Can you stay focused on it? I've had a lot of friends who were very talented who left the business. They just couldn't handle this other part of the, the, the other demands of, of uh, temperament and tenacity. 
jumping off from that, I think, Sean, I would probably be more of the tactical type of coach. Um, mm -hmm. Most of who I work with are people who are already working narrators who have run up against a problem. For example, women wanting to strengthen their menu of male voices that they do or people feeling like they're in a rut or they're maybe exploring a genre that they think I'm familiar with, like romance, for example, and they want some coaching in that genre. But this week, looking at these possible new students, I was looking at much the same thing for sure. And I had them make me an MP3 that was just two minutes. And the first minute was, tell me about yourself. And the second minute is, you know, read me something. So I wanted to hear if there was a difference between their connectedness telling me about themselves and if did they, was there a disconnect when they started reading? Because ideally, I want to feel like they're telling me a story, not that they're holding me at arm's length and, and lecturing to me. So I was listening for those kinds of things. But usually when I coach, I start my session with working narrators by saying, you tell me what we're going to work on today. And that's fundamentally different from what I do. I have a curriculum. Yep. You know, every time we meet, it's a new idea. There's a structure. And also, you know, as we move through the stuff, I go back and say, well, are you working with this concept now? Are you working with this one? And there's value. There's a great deal of value in both kinds of coaches. But Andy put her finger on it. If you're going to work with a tactical coach, you need to be a savvy enough student to know what you need to work on. You can't expect Andy to know your weak points. That takes time, a long time to figure that out, you know, back and forth. So if you're going to work with someone who has the skill that Andy or Scott or Johnny has, or PJ as well, you know, if you're going to come in and work on accents with PJ, you should find out which ones, where is your weak point and, and know that's what you want to work on and focus on. Because there's only so much you can pack into a 60 minute session. So awareness of self is certainly a useful skill to have in that situation. Mm -hmm. So Deborah, you're much more in the, uh, the hiring professional narrators rather than working with students. What kind of skills do you look for in the narrators you work with? I'm really looking for an acting background. Uh, I really, really love hiring theater actors. You know, I, I'm, I'm looking for people to give me a sample of what they love to do because I think, um, you know, what, what Sean was saying is, you know, people, people stay, either stay in this business or they don't, uh, they either, they either have it for the long haul or they don't. And I find that people have to love this thing in order to stay in it for the long haul. And I can tell you that my husband, Bob, who's now gone, that he and I love this with every breath, you know, we, we jumped out of bed every day and, you know, love this thing. And, and we were just, you know, poor to the bone <laughs> for almost two decades out of sheer love and, and out of knowing that it was going to be big someday. We just knew it. We just knew it. I think that that's, that's something that I'm looking for. And, and when I hear somebody reading, I, I just hear it. I, I hear, I hear the love in it. I hear the theater background. I hear something more than just the talent when I'm listening. So let's flip the table a little bit. When someone is looking for a coach, what are the qualities they should, they should seek when they're shopping um, to, to maybe to be their first coach? Or like Andy said, if they're looking for some sort of hurdle to overcome as an established narrator, what are the qualities in a good coach? I was looking on a, a platform where you can look up any subject and, and take a course about it. And I wondered if that platform had audiobook um, lessons. And so I entered audiobooks and indeed somebody had put up a course and I looked her up on Audible and she has two books. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. I, w I wouldn't want to learn from somebody who has barely done the thing I'm trying to learn how to do. Um, so I would, I would look up their professional reputation. I would look up what other people have to say about working with them as a coach. Uh, I would see if they offer a group uh, workshop type classes, which tend to be less expensive because the cost is spread out over, you know, 10 to 20 people instead of you working one on one um, and try them in a group environment. And then maybe pr if you feel like you would work well with them one on one, approach them about the one on one coaching, but prepare to settle in for regular coaching. It's definitely not the kind of thing where you just like 
it's been an hour and you're like, yes, I'm ready to <laughs> do all the books. <laughs> so. I couldn't have said it better, Andy, absolutely, what she said. Well, I, I would just, there's one thing I would say is that uh, in general, Andy put her finger right on it. But that being said, learning to be a coach is a different skill than learning to be doing what we do. There's a, when I decided that I wanted to coach, I'd been doing workshops and they were a lot of fun. I had a great time doing them, but I'd done workshops, like I said, on general show business topics for 20 years. And I felt like I needed to learn how to be a coach, especially because of the kind of coaching I wanted to do. So I talked with friends who were coaches in different other, you know, uh, other walks of life uh, who you know, coached people on different kinds of things and got ideas from them. I read books. I, I practiced and, and built slowly over time my own skill because especially with audiobooks, it's a self, it's mainly a self-taught experience. And so if you master the craft, whether it's audiobooks or woodworking or gardening or whatever, that's one thing. Learning to teach it is a totally different skill set. You have to learn to go, all right, what is this thing I'm doing intuitively? Let me isolate it. Let me describe it. Let me give a name to it. Let me create an exercise to show a student how to use it. And then how do I respond to what they do and teach them in the moment? It's, there's a number of steps involved. And so I've seen some narrators or I've been in the room with some narrators who have a great deal of experience as narrators, but they didn't come off as very good coaches. They weren't very articulate. And it's that old Einstein quote about if you can't explain a complex idea simply enough, then you don't understand it well enough yourself. And, and I've seen uh, on occasion someone who has years of experience, you know, they need to go and learn how to be a good teacher. So there's, you know, I think, I think, uh, so getting back to the, the bigger, the bigger question, talk, ask around. That's what, you know, private messaging is for on Facebook. Ask other people or, or start a thread, you know, say, hey, I've, I'm interested in working with such and such a coach. If you have thoughts or opinions, please, you know, contact me privately and let's talk about it. I encourage my students when they contact me, I give them a list of former students and I say, do your due diligence. Don't just take their word, you know, a couple people's words for it. Go find out some from other people. In fact, I, where at the end of my meeting with my prospective students, I don't allow them to say yes or no. I say, go away and take 24 hours and think about this. There's no special two for one sale here. There's no, you get a pony. I've laid out <laughs> what it's like to work with me. So go <laughs> think it over. And then if you're interested, then send me an email. And that also that's a nice sort of, I think a graceful way for them to really think it over. And if they realize it's not for them, because I don't take brand new students. I mean, people, they have to have several books under their belt because in my opinion, narrating nonfiction well is just more difficult than fiction. And, and if you don't have any experience at all as a narrator, the, the stuff that I teach is going to leave you, you know, just running in circles. So I want to give them a, a graceful way to acquiesce and say, you know, I don't think this is right for me right now. So those, those are some things to think about too. Excellent responses. We hear some of the same themes over and over again. You need a very specific uh, temperament of tenacity and perseverance to really, or just passion for audiobooks. It's not a quick rich scheme by any means. And uh, you might be shooting yourself in the foot if you're not fully invested in it. So uh, with that, I just wanted to thank our wonderful panelists for coming today and uh, give you the opportunity to say goodbye, promote your services, maybe even provide contact information for people who might want to get a hold of you. Um, sure. You can find me online at uh, seanprattpresents.com or send me an email directly at seanpratt at comcast.net. You can follow me on Facebook at Sean Pratt Presents or on Twitter at SP Presents. I'm always uh, available to be contacted through any of those platforms. I'm Deborah Dion, owner and producer at Dion Audio Services. That's spelled D-E-Y-A-N Audio. You can uh, send me an email at Deborah, D-E-B-R-A, at D-E-Y-A-N Audio.com. Love to have you on my roster if you're ready. And we certainly have some great classes and, and coach available to you through the Dion Institute. You can follow us on Facebook, Dion Audio. You can send me a personal friend request on Facebook. Uh, I'm under Deborah Dion, D-E-Y-A-N.
you can find me on the web at andyarnt.com and there's a contact form right there on my website to send me a message. My narrator page is on Facebook at Andy Arnt Narrator and my Twitter is at Andy underscore Arnt. So I'm happy to hear from people with questions or help in any way that I can. Very kind of you to ask. Um, my website, you can go to scottbrick.net um, or um, um, brickbybrickaudiobooks.com or scottbrickpresents.com. They all go to the same place. Um, you can reach me through my website. You can, you know, if it's teaching related, uh, shoot me an email at uh, scottbrickteaches at uh, gmail.com. And uh, yeah, connect with me on, online on uh, social media as well. And finally, Stephen. And you can find me at stephenjcohen.com. You can also find, um, find the, new, the newly reorganized business at spokenrealms.com and .net. If you go to both sites, you'll see some slightly different um, points of view on what's there. You can find me on most social media with my full name spelled out. Stephen with a V, J A Y C O H E N dot com. That counts for Facebook, Twitter, and almost anything else you can imagine. If I'm on it, usually that's the handle that's there. Fantastic. I love that name, by the way, Spoken Realms. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks again, everyone. Like I said at the beginning, we were so excited to have this discussion, and you guys did not disappoint. We thank you all for your time and your wonderful services. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. So that was some fabulous discussion. We want to thank all of our guests once again. We can't thank them enough for being with us and donating their time so our audience can be more clued in about the world of audiobooks. So I don't know about you, Paul, but I mean, this really got me more motivated to, um, to more actively pursue my own audiobook work. And so some of our listeners might be wondering ways that they can get involved, too. So we have a number of events coming up, some as soon as next month. So uh, a lot of our narrators or members on the panel today are a big fan of fellow narrator named Johnny Heller. And he's got a retreat, an audiobook retreat coming up in October 13th. So um, that's actually going to be in Rhode Island. And you can, uh, I'm not sure if registration is still open for it right now, but this is an annual event that you should really look into because it gives you a very, it's not so much like a very large co or conference atmosphere. Like you're actually at a sort of resort retreat with maybe less than 50 people who you can really network with and get to know better and improve. And um, it's just a wonderful opportunity to kind of improve all aspects of your audiobook and voiceover career. Stephen did say it was called the New England Narrators Retreat. Yeah, it has a couple of different ones. There's also Johnny Heller's Splendiferous Relaxathon. It's kind of an inside joke among the narrators. Uh, but usually it's called Johnny Heller's New England Narrator Retreat. So you can find out more information about that event at Johnny Heller's website. That's johnnyheller.com, J-O-H-N-N-Y-H-E-L-L-E-R, all one word, dot com. And um, definitely check that out. I had the pleasure of meeting him at VO Atlanta last year, and he's an incredible character as well as narrator. Well, the other big event that most narrators would want to um, mark down their calendars is APAC, and that's the Audio Publishers Association Conference. And that is on May 31st, 2018 in New York City, the location to be determined. But that is part of the Audio Publishers Association which is an organization I highly recommend everybody join if they're serious about doing audiobooks. There are special events that only members can get into at APAC, so definitely look into that. If you want to join the APA or, like I said, Audio Publisher Association, it is at audiopub.org. Definitely check that out. Uh, I think all of our uh, panelists are members of that, of that uh, association. So. And certainly advocates of it. Yeah, exactly. And you don't, you don't have to be a member to go to APAC, and it's, um, so that's, if that's something you're worried about, you don't have to be. But like Paul was saying, you do get some extra perks for being a member, and you even get some, uh, some discounts for the registration of the event itself. So definitely look into that if you're really serious about pursuing audiobook work full-time. So that pretty much wraps up this edition of the VO Meter. Measuring your voiceover progress. We want to thank all of our guests for the Audiobook Roundtable. Scott Brick, Stephen J. Cohen, Deborah Dion, and Andy Arndt, and the irascible Sean Allen Pratt. So thanks again to our wonderful panelists today. We learned so much, and I feel so invigorated, and I'm 
going to start narrating some chapters right now. So uh, on behalf of our guests, Paul and myself, I hope you all have a wonderful day, guys. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to the VO Meter, measuring your voiceover progress. To follow along, please visit www.vometer.com.